Welcome to Blue Crane Digital's introduction to the Nikon D90 digital SLR camera. This upgrade to the very popular D80 has been a worldwide success for beginning to advance photographers. Why is it so popular? The answer is simple. It can capture stunning images. This is a piece of precision gear that has great potential. But remember, the quality of the image is really determined by the operator, you. We're going to simplify this complex piece of equipment and give you the freedom to take the photos you want. This presentation is not designed to replace your camera manual. Instead, it focuses on the most important features and controls of the camera. Camera manuals cannot teach you how to shoot great photos. They are designed as technical descriptions of how each component works. They are not intended to show you what the engineers had in mind when they finalized the layout of buttons and decided how things should work together. Compare the camera manual to the owner's guide in the glove box of your car. You wouldn't dream of teaching yourself to drive just by reading it, would you? So think of this presentation as a mini driver's education course for your camera. This presentation is broken down into four main sections. First, we will discuss topics that define the quality of your images. Second, we will help you understand the components of the camera and give you the basic tools you need to improve the quality of your images. In the third section, we will address some of the advanced features and show you how they work together to create a correct exposure. Finally, we will show you how to customize the camera menus, making it easier to access the tools you need when you're out in the field. As you watch, keep the camera and the DVD remote close at hand. We want you to pause the presentation after each section and test out the settings for yourself. So let's get started. In a little over an hour, you will have the skills you need to take better photos. Before we go any further, we need to make certain the viewfinder is in focus. Look through the viewfinder and adjust the diopter dial until the focus points come into clear view. I know this seems obvious, but if the diopter adjustment is off, you won't see the best images through the lens. Your eyes will strain to see the composition. If you share your camera with someone, you'll want to check the diopter every time you prepare for a photo shoot. The camera display provides a wealth of information on current camera settings. The first of these displays is in the viewfinder. We will take a tour of the viewfinder and explain all the symbols in just a moment. You can also check the current settings in the control panel on the top of the camera and on the LCD monitor. Press info to activate the shooting information screen in the monitor. This display offers the same information you see in the control panel. In addition, any setting changes you make by pressing a camera button and turning a dial will appear on screen. The info button also acts as a toggle, allowing you to access this row of shortcut commands along the bottom of the screen. Consider using this option when shooting from a high tripod or anytime you need a larger display. To begin our tour through the viewfinder, you must first turn the mode dial to M for manual exposure. Look through the viewfinder and press the shutter release halfway. You will see a series of numbers and icons along the bottom of the screen. Center screen, there are 11 small boxes. When you press the shutter release, it's likely that one or a few large rectangles briefly blinked on. These are the active focus points. They show you where the camera is focusing. When the camera achieves focus, the focus indicator appears in the bottom left corner of the screen. If the camera cannot focus, this disc may flash or disappear altogether. The focus indicator may also flash when the autofocus mode is set for AFC for continuous focusing. Just to the right is the flash value lock icon, and below that is the auto exposure lock icon. Next is the shutter speed. Here, the shutter will open and close in 1 60th of a second. This setting means the shutter will open and close in 1 1 25th of a second. Shutter speeds of 1 second or more are marked with a double tick display. Moving to the right, we see the aperture setting. Aperture refers to the size of the opening in the lens. A smaller number indicates an open aperture. A larger number indicates the aperture is stopped down. 
This graph is called the analog exposure display. It appears when the camera is set to manual exposure mode or when exposure compensation is activated. If there are no bars to the left or right of the zero indicator, the camera can take a properly exposed photo with the current settings. If bars appear to the right, then your image will be underexposed. Bars to the left, and the picture will be overexposed. Just to the right are the battery display and the bracketing indicator, which appear above the flash compensation and the exposure compensation indicators. Next is the ISO auto display. If you press the ISO button on the back of the camera, you can check the current ISO setting in the viewfinder. Normally in this space, you will see a number in brackets. This tells you how many photos you can take before the memory card fills up. Press the shutter release halfway and the indicator changes, displaying the number of pictures that can be taken in continuous release. The K icon will appear if enough memory remains for 1,000 exposures or more. Finally, there is the flash ready indicator. We will demonstrate where each setting appears on these displays as we proceed through the presentation. The mode dial is where you turn your camera to full automatic control and forget it. Millions of point and shoot users never take this setting off of auto, but we're going to. First, we'll divide the selections into groups so they make more sense. When you set the camera on auto, it does four things for you. It focuses the lens, it meters the amount of light and the distance to your subject. It sets the aperture and finally it sets the shutter speed. You snap the photo, you get an average exposure. Nikon expanded on this theme with the settings on this side of the dial called the scene modes. Maybe you had similar scene modes on your point and shoot camera, but never got around to trying them out. Know this, the scene modes on this camera can be powerful tools for getting great photographs. When you select one of these exposure modes, the camera automatically changes the settings to match the shooting situation. This allows you to document a bike race or shoot photos of your child's birthday party without having to put a lot of thought into your camera settings. You get to be involved in the moment rather than looking at the camera dials and displays. For the portrait setting, the aperture is set wide open for a shallow depth of field. This keeps the subject in focus but blurs the background which makes the subject really stand out. Landscape works the opposite way. The camera dials the aperture closed creating what's called an infinite depth of field. That means everything in the frame is in focus. For example, in this image, the house on the far bluff is just as sharply focused as the fence post. Because the opening in the lens is small, the shutter must stay open longer to collect enough light. The camera sets the shutter speed long enough to create a correct exposure, but not so long as to risk any blur from the camera movement. You can use the landscape setting at night. Since the shutter speed will be slow, be sure to secure the camera on a tripod. The close-up setting assumes you'll be taking macro photos of small subjects, such as flowers or insects. This setting will allow you to take sharply focused photos within several inches of your subject. If you want to get in even closer, you'll need to switch to a macro lens. The sports setting uses a fast shutter speed to freeze the subject and background. When you press the shutter release halfway, the lens will continually focus on the subject behind the center focus point and it will refocus as your subject moves. This setting works well for photographing children, animals, or any subject that might move unexpectedly. When you set the dial to night portrait, the flash will fire to correctly illuminate the subject. The camera sets a slow shutter speed so the sensor has more time to collect light from the background. The result is a photo that shows both the subject and the background. Finally, this flash offsetting is just like full auto except the flash will not fire. Think of these settings as flavors of automatic. They can be very useful if you don't have time to make decisions about the camera settings. But if you want more control over your images, consider using the settings on this side of the mode dial. Programmed Auto, Shutter Priority Auto, Aperture Priority Auto, and manual. Before we get into the advanced exposure modes, we need to learn how the camera focuses in the auto and scene modes. With the camera set to auto, look at the control panel or the shooting information screen. 
you will see a small box containing 11 plus signs. This display indicates that when you press the shutter release to initiate autofocus, the camera will consider the entire frame and then choose a subject for focus. This is the default autofocus setting. It will work for most situations, but if the camera picks up the wrong subject, the resulting photo will be out of focus. Next, turn the mode dial to close up. Now you have a choice. You can use the center focus point, which is already active in the close up mode, or you can choose a new focus point. While looking through the viewfinder, press the multi selector arrow keys to reposition the focus point. With this method, you can frame the subject however you like and then move the focus point to cover it. You can also set the focus point in the sports mode. This setting is a little different because while the camera focuses on the subject behind the selected focus point, the other points will remain active. If the subject moves, the other focus points will take over and maintain the focus. Whether you change the focus point in close up or sports mode, you will first need to make sure that the focus selector lock is disabled. You can use focus point selection with the other exposure modes, but this requires changing a custom setting. We will show you how later in the advanced focus topics. Since we have started changing the camera settings, now is a good time to learn how to return the camera to its default condition. It's frustrating to discover the camera settings are incorrect just as you are ready to start shooting. This is likely to happen if you share your camera with someone. Reset the camera and you always have a consistent starting point. For the two button reset, simultaneously hold down the AF and exposure compensation buttons for two to three seconds. Each has a green dot on the camera body for quick reference. When the control panel flashes, settings such as exposure compensation, bracketing and white balance are returned to the camera defaults. We'll cover how to reset the custom settings later. For now, just understand that the two button reset can quickly get you back to a consistent starting point. Let's take a look at shutter priority. Remember how auto meters the available light and selects the shutter speed and aperture? This setting is just one small step away. The camera still focuses the lens and meters the light, but you decide how long the shutter stays open and then the camera picks the correct aperture for a properly exposed photograph. If the shutter time is short, the aperture opens wider to let in more light. A longer shutter makes the camera close down the aperture, letting in less light for a longer period. Whichever you choose, the camera will compensate. The main command dial controls the shutter speed. Press the shutter release halfway to focus and then move the dial to the left or right to get the desired shutter speed. If the words high or low appear in the aperture slot, then the shutter time is either too short or too long for a properly exposed image. The analog exposure display will appear on the shooting information screen and in the viewfinder with bars showing how much the image is under or overexposed. Turn the main command dial in the opposite direction until the analog exposure display disappears and the aperture number returns. Now the camera takes a properly exposed photo. Pause this presentation and practice adjusting the shutter until you feel comfortable with this setting. When would we use shutter priority? Here's one example. This photo was taken with a short shutter speed. The water is frozen in time. By making the shutter stay open longer, the quality of the water changes. In this photo, the water looks entirely different. With the shutter priority setting, you can decide what you want the image to communicate. Why else would you use shutter priority? Shooting sports events where fast shutter speeds are critical is a common reason. But wait, doesn't this camera have a sports setting? Yes, it does. But remember, the camera doesn't know the situation. For instance, freezing a dog in mid-splash may not require the same fast shutter as freezing a race car going 100 miles per hour. Rather than use an average setting and risk an average picture, you can take control of your images. The next setting on the mode dial is aperture priority. Before we go into details on this setting, it's important to understand the concept of depth of field and how it relates to the aperture size. 
The amount of light entering the camera is controlled by the aperture. It's like the pupil of your eye. In low light, your pupil gets larger, so you can take in more light. The aperture is displayed as the number just to the right of the shutter speed. The smaller the number, the larger the aperture. So f4 is a larger opening than f11, which is a larger opening than f22. One of the main contributors to controlling the depth of field in a photograph is the size of the aperture when the photograph is taken. I want you to try a little experiment. You can stop this presentation and come back to it after you're done. First, go to a table in your house. Set a small object, such as a salt shaker, on the front edge. Next, place another object, such as a pepper mill, in the middle of the table. Finally, place a third object on the back edge. Make sure that all three line up in a row, as we've shown here. Now, look at the objects from the tabletop level and concentrate on the pepper mill. Look at the details in the mill itself. Once you are focused on the pepper mill, the other two objects will still be in view. Don't focus on them. Focus on the pepper mill. Do you perceive the other objects to be blurry or slightly out of focus? Yes. This is the way our eyes see and our mind perceives the world. We concentrate on those things that are important and let the rest fall away. If we can make the camera mimic this visual experience by shortening the depth of field, we can influence how people look at the photo and how they feel about the subject. Now, step back and look at the whole table without concentrating on any one object. You perceive that all three objects are there, but you really don't notice the detail in any of them. The three objects are all included in your visual depth of field. How would it be if we, as photographers, decide what's important to look at? Painters have been doing this for hundreds of years. The artist decides where you focus your attention. It may be a face. It may be an orange on a table. It may be everything. But the difference between a snapshot and an artistic photograph is having the tools that enable us to make choices. We'll discuss composition later, but for now, we'll concentrate on controlling this thing called depth of field. When the digital age came along with affordable digital cameras, we could finally take all the photos we wanted and review them instantly. We could take more pictures if we didn't like the results. But go back and look at all those digital images you took with your point-and-shoot digital camera. Everything is in focus. We were taking digital snapshots. There was minimal control of depth of field. Why? Well, digital point-and-shoot cameras focus the image on a tiny image sensor. Notice how small the lens is compared to your new SLR camera. The tiny lens focusing on a tiny chip results in images that have an infinite depth of field. Your digital SLR has a larger sensor. The depth of field possible is much closer to what the human eye sees. Now we're ready to cover aperture priority. For this setting, you will adjust the lens opening and the camera will do the rest. Turn the dial to A and look through the viewfinder. Press the shutter release halfway to focus. On the lower portion of your viewfinder, you will see aperture information. This time, turn the sub-command dial to control the aperture. In most situations, the camera will set a shutter speed to match your selected aperture. But under extreme conditions, the word high or low may replace the shutter speed. This indicates a setting that will not produce a properly exposed photo. Simply turn the sub-command dial until the shutter speed number returns. There are four factors that determine the depth of field in a photograph. If you understand them, then controlling what is in or out of focus becomes much easier. We just explained how a large image sensor allows for a shallow depth of field. You can change the depth of field by moving your feet as well. Simply stepping closer to your subject will shorten the depth of field. You can see this when taking macro shots of small objects. The closer you are, the more shallow the depth of field becomes. For that reason, if you want to take macro shots with deep focus, you'll need to stop down the aperture to f22, for example. The third factor in controlling depth of field is focal length. Right now, I'm being shot with a telephoto lens on the video camera. As you can see, my face is in focus, but the foreground and the background have gone soft. Now, 
As we pull back and change to a shorter focal length, watch the foreground and the background come into focus. Finally, you can control the depth of field by adjusting the size of the lens aperture. Pause this presentation now and spend a few minutes getting familiar with these controls. Come back when you're ready to continue. When would we use aperture priority? As we discussed previously, aperture is a determining factor in setting the depth of field. Sometimes you want an infinite depth of field or deep focus. Other times you want a shallow depth of field. Your composition, subject matter, and context all play a role in finding the right balance. Experiment with taking photos at different apertures. Here is an example. Have your subject stand about 8 feet in front of a background of plants. Stand about 6 feet from your model. Put a telephoto lens on your camera and zoom your lens to 100 millimeters. This is considered a good portrait focal length. Set the camera on aperture priority and open up the lens using the subcommand dial. Take the first shot. Now, dial the aperture closed and take another photo of your model. In the photo taken with an open aperture, can you see how the subject pops off the page? There is a greater separation between the subject and the background in this photo than in the image taken with the aperture dialed closed. There is a button on the front of your camera next to the lens called the Depth of Field Preview button. Your manual explains what it is, but doesn't really explain its use. When you look through the viewfinder, you would expect to see exactly what the image sensor inside the camera sees when you fire off the shutter. In fact, the camera leaves the aperture wide open until you fire the shutter release. This allows you to have a nice bright view through the viewfinder. Try closing down the aperture. The view through the viewfinder does not change. Now, press the depth of field preview button. The camera will close the aperture to the correct setting for your image. That may allow in less light, making the scene look darker in the viewfinder. But the depth of field you see in the viewfinder will look exactly the same as in the resulting photograph. Why would you use the depth of field preview button? To determine the correct relationship between the subject and the background. You don't want an unseen object, such as a branch in the foreground, intruding on your composition. If the background is going to be more in focus than you expect, it may ruin your shot. In this way, you can use the button as a creative aid for better composition. Programmed auto mode is like auto with options. Just as in auto mode, the camera sets the shutter speed and aperture. This usually means the fastest shutter speed possible in the current conditions, and an aperture that allows in enough light for a correct exposure. By turning the main command dial, you can extend the usefulness of programmed auto. If you turn the main command dial in one direction, the shutter speed increases while the aperture opens up. Turn it in the opposite direction, and the shutter time gets longer as the aperture closes. You still get a correct exposure, but now you can decide whether the shutter speed or the aperture setting is most important to your composition. When you are using this flexible option, the letter P and an asterisk will appear in the camera's control panel and shooting information screen. To return to the default P settings, either turn the main command dial until the asterisk disappears, or turn the mode dial. Using P can be a great way to freeze the action or control the depth of field in your image depending on the situation. You have already learned how to take better photos simply by selecting an exposure mode and turning the dials. From here, we'll cover the most common setting changes. Most of these settings are accessed by pressing a button and then turning the main command dial. The first setting is the release mode. Press the button and turn the main command dial to select the release mode you want. The setting icon appears in the upper right hand corner of the control panel and the shooting information screen. The choices here are single frame, low speed continuous, high speed continuous, self timer, delayed remote, and quick response remote. The self timer sets the camera to count down 10 seconds before taking the shot. Besides self portraits, the self timer is great for shots on a tripod that require no camera movement. Any static image destined to become a larger print might be a candidate for the self-timer. 
Most new owners of the D90 either choose a single frame or continuous shooting. In high speed continuous, the camera fires up to four and a half shots per second, as long as the shutter release is held down. On the back of the camera is a button marked Qual. This stands for image quality and size. Press the button and turn the sub command dial to select the image size. By turning the main command dial, you can change the quality setting. Choices include whether to shoot RAW, also known as NEF files, or to shoot JPEG files. Some photographers just choose one quality and size setting and stick with it. However, if you shoot some images for email, some for albums, and others for large prints, you will need to know how to change this setting. With JPEGs, you have a choice of how much compression to apply. Fine applies very little compression, approximately 4 to 1, while Basic applies quite a bit, on the order of 16 to 1. In addition, the JPEG settings allow you to choose the size or number of pixels represented in the resulting file. The choices are large, medium, and small. Large will save a JPEG file that is more than 4200 pixels wide. Medium JPEGs are 3200 pixels wide and small result in JPEG images that are about 2100 pixels wide. Shooting in RAW gives you the maximum flexibility when editing your photos because it preserves the most original data. This can be especially important if you print your photos in a larger format. When you shoot in JPEG, all the tonal qualities of the image, such as sharpness, contrast, exposure, and color temperature are applied when the exposure is made. Then, the image is compressed and saved on the card. With RAW, all the data is stored as it's recorded on the sensor, with the tonal property stored off to the side. When you open your RAW files with your image processing program, you apply the tonal properties you want and adjust the image. These adjustments won't cause you to lose data. RAW images store 12 bits of data for each pixel, instead of 8 bits for JPEG images. This may be most important to you in high contrast images, such as this, where you want to retain the details in the bright clouds, but still be able to see into the shadows. Just above the Qual button is ISO. You would want to set this by pressing the button and turning the main command dial. On a film camera, ISO refers to film speed. This, of course, is a digital camera. There is no film. The designers of all digital cameras decided to use this convention from the film world to describe electronic sensor gain. This is when the camera amplifies the signal to make the image bright enough to be seen. Many of you have made tapes with a consumer video camera in extremely low light situations. Even though you can see the image, the overall quality of the video is not very good. That's because the image was captured by electronically enhancing the sensor. At higher ISO settings, the enhanced sensor can add noise to your images, making them look grainy. In the past, we have recommended taking control of the ISO setting, but image sensors and camera technology have advanced so much that except for in extreme situations, you can leave ISO on auto and not worry about it. Usually, the camera won't raise the ISO higher than 1600, but you could go a step beyond that and still not see any effects on image quality. For that reason, you may choose to leave ISO on auto all the time. The camera will increase the amplification, or ISO, if it determines there is not enough light for the current setting. ISO auto is one of the 20 ISO settings available in the scene modes or the auto exposure modes. ISO Auto is also available in P, S, A, and M, but you have to activate it through the shooting menu. Begin by pressing the menu button. Use the multi-selector up or down arrow key to access the camera icon. Press the right arrow key to enter the shooting menu, and then toggle down to the ISO sensitivity settings option. Press OK to enter the menu item. Toggle down to ISO sensitivity auto control and use the multi-selector and OK buttons to turn on auto control. Anytime the camera is set to ISO auto, this icon will appear in the control panel, the shooting information screen, and in the viewfinder. 
If the camera engages ISO auto in P, S, A, or M, the ISO number will appear in red on this playback information screen. You can also change the current ISO setting from the ISO sensitivity menu. This option is available in all the exposure mode settings. Now is a good time to pause the presentation and try turning on ISO Auto for yourself. While you're in the menu system, also take a moment to test this handy feature. It's the Help button. Press this button while you're in the menu system and the camera will bring up a help screen which will explain what that particular function or menu is for. This can be a great resource when you are still learning all the settings on the camera. If you are new to digital SLR cameras, you may miss the large screen on your point-and-shoot camera provided for framing photos. Well, Nikon now includes the Live View feature in many of its DSLR cameras. While we recommend using the viewfinder for most of your shooting, Live View can be helpful in certain circumstances. In addition, a new feature in this camera is the ability to record 2GB video clips through Live View. Press LV on the back of the camera to activate Live View. The camera's reflex mirror will flip up, allowing the image to go directly to the image sensor. Press and hold the shutter release halfway to focus. If the camera achieves focus, the focus point will turn green and the camera will sound a beep. If it is unable to focus, the focus point will flash red. You can check the focus by pressing the zoom in button and magnifying the image to nearly seven times its normal size. Use the zoom out button to return to the full screen view. This camera also allows you to select a new focus point in live view. First, you need to check the autofocus mode. In live view, autofocus mode refers to how the camera determines the focus point. So, for example, in normal AF mode, the camera focuses on the subject behind the selected point, whether it's in the center of the screen or a point you choose using the multi-selector. Wide AF mode is the same thing, only the focus point is much wider. This setting is good for landscapes, shooting sporting events, or any time you are working without a tripod. If you press the AF button on the top of the camera and turn the main command dial, you change the live view autofocus mode on screen. The third option is Face Detect. The camera searches for any faces in the scene and focuses on them. You cannot select focus points for yourself. Use this setting when shooting portraits or groups of people. Remember, if you are going to change the focus point in normal or wide AF mode, you will need to make sure the focus point selector lock is turned off. Flip the switch back to L after you finish moving the focus point. The Live View screen is boarded with icons for the current camera settings. You have already seen most of these icons in the control panel or in the viewfinder, but there are others, such as the monitor brightness icon. If the monitor appears too dark, press the playback button and use the up key on the multi-selector to brighten up the display. Now try pressing the info button. This will change the info display on the screen or bring up a grid to help you frame your subject. When Live View is active, you can also change the exposure setting, metering, white balance, and more. Then, see the new setting on screen. Before you begin recording video, you must first bring up Live View and focus on your subject. The camera will not refocus once recording begins. Press the OK button to begin recording video. A recording icon and the time remaining for your video will appear along the top right hand side of the screen. This camera can record 2 gigabyte clips of good quality video. In fact, the video you're watching right now was shot with the D90. The default movie quality setting is 640 by 424, which is almost equivalent to standard definition television. This camera can also record high definition video. To change the video quality, access the shooting menu, toggle down to movie settings, and then select quality. High definition will give you the absolute best quality video, but it will also limit the length of your videos. Depending on how much room you have on the memory card, you can shoot 5 minutes of high definition video or 20 minutes using the other quality settings. 
end your recording by pressing OK and then press LV to end live view mode. Another option would be to press the shutter release to end the recording. This will stop the video and take a still image after the last frame. As photographers, our goal is to convey our personal outlook and view of the world in the form of photographs. Good photographic composition can help you express your visual ideas. Following the guidelines of composition won't guarantee award-winning photos, but I can promise you this, your shooting will improve. I'm not asking you to memorize these rules and follow them by rote. Good photographers sometimes break the rules, but they know why and they do it for a reason. You probably have a friend or a relative who always seems to have a stack of vacation or holiday snapshots. In every batch, there may be one or two interesting shots, but the rest are pretty boring. Most people simply don't know how to make their photos interesting. They don't know how to arrange their subjects and backgrounds in an appealing way. That's what we're going to discuss now. The principles of good composition can be learned. As you look at a potential shot through the viewfinder, move the camera around to find the best image. Also, zoom with your feet. Moving a short distance can sometimes make all the difference. Here's a concept that will help you find the best arrangement of elements. It is called the rule of thirds and has been used by artists for hundreds of years. Divide the horizontal plane and the vertical plane into thirds. The intersections of these lines are the best places to locate important subjects. If you have a subject with prominent lines or edges, such as a building or a seascape, place them along the rule of thirds lines. A few words about horizons. Never allow the horizon to cross the image plane exactly in the middle. If you want to feature a subject that lies above the horizon, such as a beautiful sunset, place the horizon lower than the center line. If your main area of interest is below the horizon, arrange the shot so that the horizon is higher than the center line. Teach yourself to visualize thirds when you're looking at photographs and artwork. You will notice that professional photographers use this concept all the time. You will see the rule of thirds in television commercials, movies, and documentaries. A problem with so many snapshots is that the people are so tiny you can hardly tell who they are. The photographer has tried to cram a lot of information about who and where into one photograph. It doesn't work. The solution is to get specific with your framing. Fill up the viewfinder with the important stuff, the people, and enough of the surrounding details to identify the location. Then take additional photos to explore the place, the view, the architecture, the food. A photograph, like a painting or a drawing, is a two-dimensional object. The big issue facing photographers is this. How do you depict the three-dimensional world on two-dimensional paper? How do you avoid a flat look to your photos? There are things you can do to help the viewer see the third dimension. Rule number one. You must understand the technical aspects of focusing your camera. Focus is the most important component of making a good photograph. The sharp edges and the clarity of the focus subject engage the eye of the viewer. To make your area of sharp focus more forceful, contrast it against an area of softer focus. To control the line between sharp and soft focus, you must understand depth of field and put it to work in your images. The contrast of a sharply focused subject against a soft background will greatly intensify the illusion of three dimensions. A few more tips that add depth. If possible, take advantage of overlapping objects. Overlaps show that one object is in front of another object in space. Use this trick to give your photographs the feeling of space and depth in the real world. Elements of perspective can be used to enhance the third dimension. Things like a line of telephone poles going away from you, or a row of arches in a building, or a road winding off into the distance. Buildings can be a great source of perspective clues. 
Look what happens with walls and roof lines as they rise up and away from you. These are all indications that the scene has space and depth. We have talked about a number of things that you can do to improve your photographs through composition. We talked about the rule of thirds, which will help you place your subject in the photographic plane. We've talked about sharp and soft focus and discuss ways to create depth and space. We have only begun to touch on the subject of photographic composition. If you'd like to find out more, complete books on the subject are available. Use these guidelines and you'll be thinking about photographs in a new way. We have reached the point in this presentation where we will want to launch into the more advanced topics. The majority of the settings we will discuss apply only to the advanced exposure modes, P, S, A, and M. But the concepts such as white balance, metering, and focus are important to understand no matter which shooting mode you choose. Keep your camera and remote with you and try out each setting before proceeding to the next topic. White balance is a topic that can either be very simple or a little more involved, based on your needs as a photographer. Happily, the camera gives you white balance settings that work well under a variety of conditions. First, a short explanation of color temperature. When we shoot photographs, we can have a variety of light sources, each with its own characteristics. Color temperature refers to the spectrum of visible light illuminating an object. We measure the light spectrum in what is called Kelvin temperature. The physics behind Kelvin calculations can be tricky, so just think of it this way. Each color corresponds to a specific Kelvin temperature. You would get just about the same color if you heated carbon to the same temperature on the Celsius scale. For example, carbon glows red at 2000 degrees centigrade, but when it's heated to 5500 degrees, it's white hot. In the same way, the white light of the noonday sun measures about 5200 degrees Kelvin. At that time of day, the Earth's atmosphere has allowed the entire visible spectrum of light to pass through and illuminate our world. An hour after sunrise, or an hour before sunset, the curvature of the Earth and atmosphere restricts the amount of light that can reach us. When the sun is low above the horizon, the atmosphere scatters short wavelength colors, such as blue and violet. But long wavelength colors, such as red and yellow, come to us through the atmosphere, creating a more golden colored light. In this case, the color temperature is lower, about 2900 degrees. We've all seen the red sunset, or the golden light that is so beautiful an hour before the sun goes down. The light given off by incandescent bulbs is similar to this light. In contrast, candlelight is very red, with a very low color temperature. Think of how your friends look sitting in front of a fireplace. Firelight is about 1900 degrees Kelvin. We're not talking about the intensity of the light, but rather the composition of the light spectrum. Most of the time, we want to represent the true color of something. We want the people in our pictures to have natural skin tones. This camera has many settings for white balance. Each is designed to compensate for a specific light source. Let's look at auto white balance first. In this setting, the camera meters the light coming through the lens and compensates for the color temperature being recorded. Auto white balance causes the exposure to appear as if it was made under natural sunlight. In cloudy daylight conditions, the clouds actually block out some of the longer waves, resulting in a color temperature higher or bluer than bright sunlight. Shady conditions usually have a higher color temperature, about 8000 degrees. Auto white balance filters out the blue, shifting the colors back toward the red and yellow range. If you are shooting indoors under incandescent light or firelight, the auto white balance shifts the camera settings back toward the blue range. This shift results in skin tones that look natural. If you want this natural sunlight look, the auto white balance setting does a remarkable job. For many photographers, this is a setting that never gets changed. But you can use the optional white balance values like fluorescent or daylight to create better photographs before you upload the images into your computer. Let's say you're taking a walk just before sunset. The light is making everything a beautiful golden color. The shadows are fantastic. If you are shooting JPEG images in auto white balance, 
the camera will shift everything toward blue to compensate for the yellow-orange light. Then it will compress your image and store it on your memory card. That beautiful light is gone. You can use software to shift the color back toward the yellow-orange range later, but it's work that can be avoided. You will be losing data from your original image. Why? Well, the program you use to shift the colors will compress the JPEG file a second time, discarding more of the original data. You may decide to print this photo, but you've already given data away twice. If you set the white balance correctly at the time you take the photo, you won't have to spend time fixing it later. In order to understand exactly what the white balance setting does, we have to do a little experiment. Go outside on a bright day and pick a subject to photograph. Press white balance and turn the main command dial to select auto white balance. Take a photo of your subject. Change the white balance setting to incandescent and take another photo. You can do this on screen as we have here in live view. Continue until you have tested out each white balance setting. Review the photos on your computer. As you scroll through the images, you will notice that each image has a different hue. For example, the image taken with the incandescent setting looks very blue. But wait, doesn't incandescent light have an orange hue? So why did the image turn out blue? You have to think about it backwards. The camera shifts the color into the blue range because it's set for taking images in the equivalent of an incandescent light bulb. Under those conditions, adding blue to an image makes it look as though it was taken in natural daylight. But the photo was taken under natural light, which includes the blue spectrum. As a result, the camera added a lot of blue on top of the already present blue light. The result is an image that is very blue. Conversely, when the white balance is set to shade, the camera will shift the color balance toward the red end of the spectrum. Under natural daylight, which includes reds and oranges, you will end up with an abundance of orange and yellow hues in your image. So, if you're shooting an hour before sunset and you want to capture that golden light, try setting the white balance to direct sunlight rather than selecting auto white balance. This will record more of the yellow-orange light your eye perceives. Exposure compensation is one of the most important controls on your camera. Once you understand how it works, you'll find yourself using exposure compensation all the time to get the best images possible. Typically, photographers use exposure compensation to correct the exposure on backlit subjects or subjects that are much brighter than the background. For example, here the camera sets the exposure for the bright sky, making the tower in the foreground look dark. We use exposure compensation to increase the exposure for the subject in the foreground. The background is blown out, but the tower is correctly exposed. Press exposure compensation and turn the main command dial to the left to increase the exposure. Turn the dial to the right to underexpose the image. Try this experiment at home to better understand exposure compensation. Find a location under a porch or an archway that looks out into a sunny spot. Position your subject in the shade and turn the camera to live view. Frame up your subject so that you can see a generous amount of the background and take a picture. The camera will set an average exposure for the entire scene. This will be too low for your subject, who now looks dark. Press the exposure compensation button and turn the main command dial to increase the exposure. Your subject will be correctly lit even though the background is blown out. Now, turn the camera and your subject around and shoot another photo from the sunny spot into the shadows. Your subject is lit by the sun, but most of the frame is filled with shadows. Since the camera will set an average exposure for the scene, your subject will end up overexposed. This time, use exposure compensation to decrease the exposure. When exposure compensation is activated, the analog exposure meter will appear on the shooting information screen and in the viewfinder. Only the exposure compensation icon will appear in the control panel. Exposure compensation is a tool professional photographers use all the time. It can be crucial to getting the exact exposure you want. Just remember this. You must either turn the compensation back to zero or reset the camera to erase this setting.
We have already talked a little bit about focusing the camera and selecting a focus point. But how do you decide when to focus? You may be taking a portrait of someone standing completely still. Or you may be at the zoo where an animal's movement is unpredictable. The D90 has a setting for each of these situations and one for everything in between. You set the AF mode by pressing this button and turning the main command dial. First, we will discuss single servo AF. Single servo freezes the focus when you press the shutter release halfway. If a proper focus is obtained, the in focus indicator will appear in the viewfinder and the camera sounds a soft beep. This setting is good for stationary subjects like portraits or landscapes. The second option we'll cover is continuous servo AF. With this setting, the camera continues to search for the correct focus behind the selected focus bracket until the shutter button is released. The in focus indicator does not need to be visible in the viewfinder for you to take a photo. This setting is great for constantly moving subjects like small children or animals. Finally, there is auto select, which allows the camera to determine the correct AF mode. The camera starts in single servo mode. But if the subject moves, it switches to continuous. When shooting in auto select, the in focus indicator must be visible for you to take the photo. Auto select is really the most flexible of all the options. Unless continuous servo is absolutely necessary, you can just let the camera change from single to continuous as needed. This camera also allows you to select the focus point in any of the exposure modes, but you will have to go into the custom settings menu to do it. Press menu and navigate to the pencil icon. This is the custom settings menu. Use the multi selector to access the autofocus submenu and choose setting A1, AF area mode. For all the exposure modes except close up and sports, the default autofocus mode is auto area. In this setting, the camera will look for faces, objects close to the lens, or groups of objects in the center of the frame to choose an appropriate focus point. For many situations, this may be okay, but by changing the AF area mode, you can get better control over your end results. We will begin with single point. Just as we described earlier with the close up and sports modes, you can use the multi selector to choose any one of 11 focus points. If you select single shot while in P, S, A or M, the camera will apply this setting to all of the advanced exposure modes. Go back into A1 again and select dynamic area AF. Now when we look at the shooting information screen, we see that we can still select the focus area in the frame, but that focus area is now surrounded by plus signs. It's important to note that how dynamic area AF works really depends on the current focus mode. If the focus mode is set to AFS for single shots, then dynamic area AF will work just like single point AF. The difference comes when the focus mode is on either continuous or auto select. The camera does not lock the focus. It continuously focuses on your subject. At the same time, the other 10 focus points are still active. So if the subject moves, the camera can track it and maintain focus. Finally, change the value of A1 to 3D tracking. This is similar to dynamic area AF, but the selected focus area in the viewfinder will change as the subject enters a new area of the frame. This setting is especially useful if you frame up and focus your subject in the center of the frame, then reframe before taking the shot. Just taking control of this one custom setting and deciding where you want the camera to focus will result in consistently better photographs. Sometimes you may wish to lock the exposure or the focus. You can lock both at the same time by pressing this AEAF lock button. Fill your frame with a subject you wish to photograph and then press AE lock. The camera will measure the exposure then lock it. The following is an example of when you might want to use AE lock. Here we have a backlit subject, but just out of the frame we have a fairly neutral scene without backlighting. If we lock the exposure on an area of the frame without backlighting, then reframe the subject, the camera will expose it correctly. The background may be blown out, but the backlit subject is clearly visible. 
Use a similar technique when the camera can't achieve focus. First, make sure the AF mode is set to single servo. Now, find an object that is about the same distance from you as your subject. Press the shutter release halfway. The camera will lock the focus on this subject without locking the exposure. You should hear the camera beep when this happens. Now, keep holding the shutter release as you turn back to your subject. Once you're happy with the framing, you can finish pressing the shutter release and take the shot. This camera comes equipped with three metering options, matrix, center weighted, and spot. The default setting is matrix metering. The camera considers the entire frame and an average exposure is taken to capture as many highlights and shadows as possible. This setting does a great job most of the time. Now, it's true that matrix metering measures distance, colors, and contrast, but the primary thing metering does is determine how dark or light the scene is and how to create an exposure that allows you to see as much detail as possible. Next is center weighted metering. The camera will still look at the entire frame, but gives more importance to the 8mm circle at the very center of the frame rather than the edges. The last option is spot metering. Here, the camera uses a tiny percentage of the frame for its measurement. If the camera is set to single or dynamic area AF, then metering will be based on a 3mm area around the current focus point. Otherwise, the camera measures around the center focus point. So, in situations of backlighting, high contrast, or multiple light sources, you can ensure that your subject will be properly exposed. Simply meter on the subject you consider to have a middle value. Many advanced photographers use center-weighted metering as their default choice. They lock the focus and metering by pressing AE lock, reframe their photo, and take the shot. The built-in flash can be a great tool for increasing the quality of your photographs under a variety of lighting conditions. Fire off the flash on the D90, and you may notice something interesting. The flash fires twice. The D90 sends the first flash out and meters the light through the lens. It then compensates with a second flash while exposing the photo. Most beginning photographers use the flash on their camera when they are indoors under low light. Here's a tip. Use your flash outside under bright sunny skies. The flash will fill in some of the harsh shadows created by the sun. Another good use for your flash is to illuminate a backlit subject. Rather than using exposure compensation and blowing out the details in the background, add some light to the subject with the built-in flash. We have all seen that typical blown out flash look in snapshots. If you configure your flash correctly, you won't have to worry about any blown out images. The D90 allows you to configure both the intensity and the timing of the flash. First, we will look at flash compensation. Press the flash compensation button on the front of the camera. Turn the sub-command dial to decrease the flash intensity by up to three EV steps. The result will be a typical fill flash that's very useful for back and side lit images. Rotate the sub-command dial in the other direction and the flash intensity will increase by up to one EV step. This camera offers five different flash modes. For the most part, you will use the fill flash setting, which is signified by the flash arrow. When taking portraits, however, you may consider using the red eye reduction flash mode, or red eye plus slow sync. The slow sync flash allows for more exposure of the background in your images. This setting is not available in shutter priority auto or manual mode. In order to ensure you have the photos you want, you need to review them before moving on to a new subject. After all, you can't go back and take a second shot when you are sitting at your computer looking at your images. Press playback to display images on the memory card. The most recent photo will appear in the monitor. Turn the main command dial or use the multi-selector left and right keys to proceed through the stored images. By examining your images, especially if they are magnified, you will get valuable information on how your exposure settings are working. To enlarge your images, press the zoom in button. A small yellow box will appear on screen, describing the enlarged area. 
you can move the box around with the multi selector. If you want to see more images at the same magnification, just turn the main command dial. To return to the full screen view, press zoom out. If you continue pressing zoom out, the camera will bring up four thumbnail images, then nine, then 72 images, and finally, a calendar view of all your image thumbnails. From the calendar view, use your multi selector to choose a new shooting date. Press the zoom out button to access your images. Use the multi selector to highlight any image and then press OK to see that photo full screen. The delete key will erase the image displayed in the monitor. Press it once to select the image and a second time to delete it. To delete more than one image, go into the playback menu and select delete. You can select several images at once to erase, erase by date or erase the entire memory card. To mark images for deletion, press the zoom out key, then use the OK button and up arrow keys to confirm. You may protect an image from deletion by pressing the protect key. However, if you later format the memory card, these protected images will be erased along with the unprotected images. Here's one more helpful option. This camera has the ability to sense the orientation, portrait or landscape when taking a shot. You can turn on the option in the setup menu by setting auto image rotation to on. Then in the playback menu, set rotate tall to on. Now the camera will rotate portrait mode thumbnails for upright viewing. You can check the camera settings for each recorded image by pressing the up or down arrow keys on the multi selector. There are as many as eight screens of information available, but you can decide which screens you want to display. From the playback menu, choose display mode. Check off the boxes of the information pages you would like to see. One useful option is highlights. When this function is turned on, any areas of the photo where the highlights are blown out will blink. Details in these areas are gone forever. If you see large sections of the photo are blinking, you'll want to adjust your settings so the sensor can capture more details. Just remember, all the information on these displays is there to support your decision of whether the image looks good. That's what really matters. If you like the way the exposure looks now, you'll probably like it later. Now that we have talked about some of the camera menus, you may have a sense of how large and complex the menu system can be. Luckily, Nikon provides a way to streamline the entire menu system. It's called My Menu. This offers you an opportunity to put any frequently used settings into one location. In the menu system, toggle down to the notebook icon. Use this icon to access both the My Menu settings and a list of the most recent setting changes. To switch between recent settings and my menu, toggle down to choose tab and then use the multi selector to choose my menu. To build your menu, first select add items, choose a menu to work from and then use the multi selector up and down keys to access the menu item you want and then press OK. Press the right arrow key twice to return to the menu list and select more items. As you add each setting, you can use the up and down arrow keys to change its ranking in my menu. Put the settings you'll need the most at the top. We know you've already looked. That's right, there are 41 custom settings for the D90. The custom settings are subdivided into most of the groups A through F to make them easier to locate. An asterisk next to the custom setting number indicates the value is no longer set to the default. We'll cover a few custom settings we think are important. This section will go by fast, so have your remote on hand and stop the presentation to test each setting for yourself. The A group of custom settings affects the camera's autofocus functions. We already discussed using A1 to change the AF area mode. Custom setting A2 allows you to select the size of the center focus point. Normal zone is the default and it is good for focusing on stationary objects. Wide zone is good for shooting sports or any subjects that might move while you're shooting. The larger area makes it easier to keep the subject behind the center focus point. Custom setting A7 has the same autofocus settings we used in live view. 
you can change the autofocus setting in this menu or press the AF button and turn the main command dial when the camera is in live view mode. The custom settings listed under B deal with metering and exposure. B2 may be the most useful setting in this group. If you turn on B2, you'll be able to set the exposure compensation without pressing this button first. All you have to do is turn one of the command dials. The question is, which dial? That depends on the exposure mode setting. When the camera is set to programmed auto or shutter priority, the sub-command dial will control exposure compensation. In aperture priority, you would use the main command dial. Notice that in each shooting mode, you will be turning the dial not used to make the exposure setting. The custom settings in the C group deal with either timers or AE lock. Consider using custom setting C3, which allows you to set the self-timer countdown and the number of shots taken. The default is 10 seconds, but you can select 2 seconds, for example, and then use the self-timer to take photos on a tripod. That will minimize any potential movement from the pressing of the shutter release. Custom settings D1 through D12 allow you to customize the shooting and camera displays. You may wish to turn on D2, for example, to add grid lines to your viewfinder. These lines will help you frame horizons or architectural elements in your photographs. The Group E custom settings are for changing the bracketing and flash functions, and Group F allows you to reconfigure some of the camera controls. There are a lot of options here, but we recommend you look at the first three settings, F1, F2, and F3. These allow you to reprogram the on switch, the OK button, and the function button on the front of the camera. Custom setting F1 gives you the choice between using the on switch to turn on the control panel backlight or using it as a toggle switch for both the backlight and the shooting information screen. Normally, you have to press info to bring up the shooting information screen. By taking F1 off the default, you can turn the screen on and off without taking your hand away from the shutter release. Custom setting F2 gives you three options for using the OK button when you are shooting in single or dynamic area AF. In the default setting, you would press OK to return the focus point to the center of the screen. If you select Highlight Active Focus Point, then anytime you press OK, the focus points will light up red in the viewfinder. This will make it easier to see the active focus point. The third option disables the OK button in the shooting modes. Finally, there's custom setting F3. Use F3 to program the function button to activate any of the settings you see here. For example, if you were to select spot metering, then anytime you pressed and held the function button, the camera would temporarily switch the current metering setting to spot metering. As you are looking through the F3 options, don't discount this one. Access top item in my menu. Essentially, this allows you to access any setting from any menu with the touch of a button. For example, LCD brightness is a setup menu item that you might use quite often. Put it at the top of your My Menu list and then link the function button to My Menu. Now, anytime the lighting changes and makes the monitor difficult to see, you just need to press the function button to bring up the brightness control. Explore the options when you have the time. You might find it useful to have a frequently used camera setting just a push button away. To return the custom settings to their defaults, access Reset Custom Settings at the top of the menu screen. Select Yes and press OK to confirm. The Setup menu is one of the first things you looked at when you got the D90. But once you have set the time and language preferences, do you really need to go back to it? Yes. There are a few options on the setup menu that you may need. For example, we already demonstrated how to set auto image rotation. You may also need to clean the image sensor to remove any dust particles. If there is dust on the sensor, then go to Clean Image Sensor in the setup menu and select Clean Now. You can set up the camera to automatically clean the sensor at startup, shutdown, or both. You may want to consider adding this function to your My Menu list as a reminder to clean the image sensor. We have covered a lot of the settings that you will need for everyday shooting, but there is much more to this camera. If you want to learn more advanced settings and photography concepts, then pick up Volume 2 of this DVD. 
The presentation covers topics such as slow sync flash and picture controls. It goes into more detail with the custom settings and even discusses color management. Here's one more thing you may find useful. Blue Crane Digital makes a laminated reference card for the D90 that you can carry in your bag. It's color coded so that you can find the answers to your questions quickly. It's called In Brief. If your local camera store doesn't carry the In Brief, then check our website for a list of retailers. We have covered a lot of ground over the course of this presentation. Some of it may seem very complicated now, but it will make more sense as you begin to use the camera. The good news is, many of the features and options are there for stylistic purposes. You can choose not to use them and still take fantastic photos. What we hope you take away from the presentation is the solid understanding of how the main camera controls can help you take great photos. Be sure to practice the settings and techniques and look for opportunities to improve the composition of your images. Soon, you'll be taking better photographs than ever before. Thanks for watching. Now go out and take some great photos. Mm -hmm.